All right, welcome back. Let's keep trucking along. All right. Unfortunately, thermal injuries, or burns, are a common injury in the pediatric population. Burns are the second leading cause of accidental death in children under the age of 15 after automobile accidents. Children under the age of 2 have a higher mortality rate due to greater central body surface area, greater fluid volume, and less effective cardiovascular responses to fluid volume shifts. I listed out four types of burns for you on your slide so you can read through those. So who is at risk and for what type of burn? People often look at infants and they think, okay, they can see infants uh, for thermal burns for house fires, but for hot liquids, everybody always thinks about microwaving bottles. Mm, not necessarily that. How many parents do you see, and we're all guilty of this because we've all had crying babies, but you're holding an infant, but you're so hungry too, and so you're leaning over and maybe you're sipping, you know, hot Starbucks. Maybe you are drinking hot tea. Maybe you're drinking hot chocolate. Maybe you're just eating hot food for like, you know, the first and last time that you'll have, you know, when your kids are little for a long time. But something happens, somebody jolts you, somebody bumps you, and you spill. That um, Thermal burns in babies can also occur that way, just from accidental spills from parents who are holding babies while they eat or drink. So just be aware of that. Um, toddlers, again, thermal burns, because again, they have contact with hot liquids. Electrical burns, you can read through that. Chemical burns, oh, because toddlers put non-food items in their mouth and it's gross. Um, and they come in contact with caustic things too. Uh, preschoolers, again, you can read through that. There's not anything too surprising there. How many preschoolers have come up and, you know, picked up mom's chi iron or picked up the curling iron or touched, you know, something on the stove and it happens. Toddlers do the same thing. School age, uh, now our kids are getting a little bit more brave, um, especially <laughs> 4th of July time. Um, kids get really curious and they always want to be the ones to light the fireworks. They know that they should not be doing that, so they oftentimes do things in secret. So they will disappear, they will hide with matches, maybe they'll light a firework and maybe they'll accidentally set the house on fire. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, um, there was a set of twins who were in kindergarten and a long time ago, boys and girls, kindergarten was only a half a day. And so because I was a goody goody uh, two shoes in school, I got to go and walk these two little um, kindergartner, kindergarten twins home um, at the, you know, when they got done with kindergarten in the morning. And then of course they lived like right across the street from the school, but I'd go and I'd help them cross the street and walk them home because of various reasons. Anyway, long story short, one of them, um, the mom was taking a nap in the afternoon and fell asleep and the uh, school age girls got curious about mom's lighter and they picked it up and they accidentally set the mattress on fire in the bedroom where they were playing. <clears throat> and then they were scared because they had started this big fire and the mom was asleep and so they hid because they didn't want to get caught and they didn't want to get in trouble. And the duplex that they lived in um, nearly burned down to the ground um, and the girls were okay. But imagine my horror when um, I walked the girls home and then walked back up the sidewalk of the school and then later there were fire trucks and then, you know, when we went out to the playground, we saw the fire trucks at their house and then um, I was extremely upset and teachers had to tell me what had happened. So school age children definitely get involved. They are definitely curious about fire and lighters and things like that. It's so important to keep all that stuff away. Adolescents, again, obsessed with fireworks. They want to be the ones to light them. They're also at risk for um, chemical, electrical, radiation burns, sunburns, because people want to be tan. So as you can see, the top pick shows an electrical burn that was caused from biting an electrical cord. The current arcs through the lips and it can cause full thickness injury through the mucosa, muscle, nerve, and blood vessels. The labial artery may be injured and cause significant bleeding once the S-car falls off in two to three weeks. 
The bottom pick you can see is a, a small toddler with a thermal burn or scalding. And we, I don't know the story of how it happened, but something has scalded that child. So assessment of pediatric burns. Some of this should be a review from when you guys talked about skin and burns already, so I hope it's a review. You should know the severity is determined by the depth of the burn. The percent of the body surface area that is affected and from the involvement of which specific body parts. Roughly the palm of a child's hand is 1% of their body surface area. So with first degree or superficial burns, pain is your primary symptom. You get damage to the epidermis only. That's your best bet. Second degree burns, those are now a partial thickness burn. You get damage to the epidermis and part of the dermis. These wounds are going to be red, they're going to blister, they're extremely sensitive to temperature change, exposure to air, and sensitive to touch. You can get second degree sunburns too, by the way. Third degree, you get full thickness. This involves the epidermis, the dermis, all the way down into the subcutaneous tissue. Nerve endings, sweat glands, hair follicles are destroyed. These lack the sensation to the area. These require surgical excision and grafting to close the wound. The periphery may be a second degree with the center a third degree. Fourth degree, this is full thickness and the underlying tissue. These burns involve the muscle, fascia, and the bone. The wound appears dull and dry. Ligaments, tendons, and bone may all be exposed. One of the major, uh, a major burn injury, those major burn injuries are going to be treated in a specialized burn center. Around here, it's at Mercy. Mercy is the only place around here that I know of that has a dedicated burn unit. Moderate burn injuries um, are going to be treated in the hospital with an expertise in a, with, in a hospital with expertise in burn treatment. Again, possibly a wound, possibly Mercy for like the burn center, um, unless there's like a outpatient like burn type clinic. And then minor burn injuries, those are going to be treated in the outpatient setting. Inhalation injuries, um, children get these, uh, they sustain damage to their tracheobronchial tree following inhalation of heated gases and chemicals produced during fire. Clinical manifestations may be delayed 24 to 48 hours. Wheezing, hoarseness, wet rails, carbonaceous secretions are signs of respiratory tract involvement. Facial burns, including lips and nasal hairs, are an indicator of a burned respiratory tract. Okay, so remember that great little rule of nines that you guys learned to evaluate the percent of burn? Yeah, you can't use it in pediatrics because children have these ever-changing proportions. So no rule of nines in evaluating burns in pediatric patients. And this table basically just goes over all the different types of burns that I just went over in the previous slide. But if you're a visual person, instead of an auditory person, and want to look at it in a table, here you go. This slide's for you. And so here's just some pictures of some uh, bad burns. If you look at the two pictures that are on the left, uh, picture A or the top picture just shows you a, a superficial partial thickness burn. The blisters are intact. And down in picture B, the blisters have been removed. And you can see the different shade. You can see how pink the dermis is and how um, the epidermis is pretty much sloughed off now. The picture on the right shows a full thickness burn with muscle and fascia involved. Owie. And this particular burn shows varying levels of burn. So see the red area um, kind of at the bottom of the picture. Um, that's a deep partial thickness. Then it bleeds into like a white area, which is your full thickness burn. 
and that leads up into the black area that is a full thickness with that um, S car. All right, so burn treatment. Do decrease your burn fluid losses. When you have a break in your skin, it's an open pathway not only for infection, but it's a good way to uh, have insensible fluid loss. Remember, think about babies. Babies, one of their problems is they have really thin skin and they're very prone to um, insensible water loss. Same kind of thing happens when you have burns because you have a compromise in your skin's integrity. So for infection prevention, I already mentioned that. Control pain, golly, burns hurt like crazy. Promote nutrition because we need these, we need the skin to heal and repair itself. And then the other big thing is to try and salvage all viable tissue. Therapeutic management, please go through and read this as far as your nursing priorities. <laughs> Even in burns, airway maintenance is your first priority. Infection prevention is going to be right up there as well as that uh, managing fluid, fluid loss. Your priorities are sort of listed out for you on your slide. Management of a burn wound. Primary excision um, is um, basically the removal of the dead skin and this will occur as soon as the child is hemodynamically stable after initial resuscitation. Next comes the debridement stage. This is painful. This will require pain medicine and sedation during the procedure. Benadryl can be used later to help control the itching of the wound. Hydrotherapy may be, may be included in the debridement uh, phase as well. That includes soaking in a tub or a shower once a day for up to 20 minutes. The water helps loosen and remove the sloughing tissue and any exudate and any residual topical medications. The next thing um, after debridement comes uh, the topical antimicrobial agents. New application of those is applied. And then the very last step is to uh, biologic skin covering and or grafting. I listed out some of your biologic skin coverings um, choices for you on your slide. And then of course pain management, prevent complications and provide a lot of emotional support as well. So these pictures show, um, the lower picture shows the removal of split thickness skin with a dermatome. The top um, picture is a sheet graft, which means they've taken a full sheet of skin to cover that. Sheet grafts are used in highly cosmetic areas. The downside is the sheet of skin does not go very far. So it's not a, necessarily a good choice if you have a large area that you need to graft. The bottom picture shows a mesh graft. With mesh grafts, the donor skin is passed through a mesher, very technical term, which causes the tiny slits in the skin, it helps it cover anywhere from one and a half to nine times. It's amazing to me we can't pinpoint that number down a little bit better. One and a half to nine times more area than a full thickness sheet graft. The cosmetic outcomes are not as great though with a mesh graft as they are with a sheet graft. And I don't know, I didn't put this on here yet because I haven't, it's not, your textbook doesn't talk about it, but fish scales. Um, I'm sure you guys have probably all been on Facebook and seen some of the, um, seen a video about how they're starting to use uh, fish skin and fish scales because they're, um, the fish skin is high in collagen um, and they're having fantastic results um, covering, uh, you know, significant areas that have been burned with fish scales to help with wound um, closure. And the results are absolutely amazing that you see. So maybe that'll be the way of the future. What are we evaluating? Do we have adequate pain relief? How do we evaluate that? We're going to have a pain scale and we're going to ask our patient, right? If they can talk, if they can't, we're going to evaluate them on the pain scale. Are they free from infection? How do we monitor for infection? Yes, I will let you say monitor the temperature because we will. We're also going to draw those labs too. We're going to be watching that white count. We're watching 
lots of different things. We're going to evaluate their blood pressure because blood pressure can go down, especially if somebody's going into septic shock. Uh, adequate urine output. How much urine output do we need? In a pediatric world, how much urine output are we actually asking for? You should look this up and you need to know it. Do we have adequate perfusion? Do we have joint mobility? Do we have adequate pulses? How are we going to check for pulses over an area that has been grafted? Do we want to touch it? Do we want to risk infecting, you know, and causing an infection? No, we may have to use a Doppler. If we have pulses, we should have perfusion. If there isn't too much edema, it may be difficult to assess. And do we have adequate nutrition? Body stockings are worn all the time to reduce blood flow to the scar tissue to prevent contractures, deformity, and disfigurement. Splints and appliances may also be needed to maintain certain position of extremities. Scar tissue in children tends to cause them a lot of discomfort, it tends to be very itchy. This can be treated with H1 and H2 antagonists like Zyrtec and Tagamet, as well as lotion. Massage therapy during uh, lotion application is also very helpful. If scar tissue has no sweat glands, then what happens when the child is at the beach or the pool or a soccer game later? That's right. If you can't sweat, you can't cool down. So children who have a lot of scar tissue are going to be prone for heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Hydration will become so important because they can't be overheated because they can't compensate when they get too hot. Because scar tissue doesn't grow and expand like other tissue, future revisions and surgeries may be needed to maintain function and mobility. And psychosocial issues, whoo, separation anxiety for little kids, fear of their own appearance, fear of scaring others with their appearance, fear of not fitting in with other kids, isolation from friends. These are all very real and very legitimate fears for children who have significant burns. What you need to do is have the children do as much self-care as possible. Possibly they will need therapy. Possibly the whole family will need therapy. Parents may have a lot of guilt related to their child's injuries as well. And we've talked about that at the beginning of PEDS. Hindsight is 2020, so <laughs> teaching parents about burn prevention is big. Ideally, we want to teach them about it during well child checkups. Um, during other times when you see kids, hopefully we're not teaching children or parents about burn prevention after their child has already had a burn. So now to talk a little bit about um, a topic that just absolutely enrages me, it would be child abuse. In this picture you can see the great marks on this child's cheek where this child was held down or something hot was pressed against this child's cheek. Also something else you want to do is um, when you see the feet of the toddler, see how it looks like the baby has like red socks almost like on, how the burns go up just past the ankles and then there's a very definite line where they stopped. Um, you look for burns on the hands or the feet that are like gloves or stockings. That tells you that somebody dipped this baby's feet and ankles into boiling water. We've talked about these things already in this program, so I don't think we really need to go through them again. Um, you should have already, con you know, discussed all of these things already in the ER unit. All right, fungal infections, thrush. Uh, thrush is caused from yeast, in babies, it can be triggered from um, a variety of sources. Um, in older children, though, it can be triggered from the regular use of their corticosteroid inhaler or from antibiotic use. Uh, in babies, you want to look for like milk residue on the tongue or inside the mouth. If you take a piece of gauze, if you can wipe it away, that's just milk residue. But if you wipe the tongue and the whiteness still stays on the tongue, that's thrush. Milk residue wipes away, thrush will not. Downside is, you know, especially for babies, thrush is painful. If children have it, they don't want to eat. So if you take a baby who all of a sudden 
starts refusing to breastfeed, doesn't want to take a bottle, or starts feeding if, you know, takes a few sucks and then starts screaming, that tells you it hurts when they swallow, something's going on in their mouth. Oftentimes, thrush will occur simultaneously with diaper rash. Treatment is oral nystatin or fluconazole, diflucan if you will. Um, thrush is kind of hard to get rid of, it's kind of tricky. Teach parents to sterilize pacifiers, they need to boil them, they need to boil the bottle nipples. Um, anything that babies put in their mouth has to be boiled and sanitized. Rinse the mouth after using the inhaler, clean the spacer in between use, and if mom is breastfeeding, mom needs to be treated for thrush as well. And the pediatricians will usually go ahead and treat mom too if she's breastfeeding. And this is just a picture of a baby who has thrush. See the white, the white on the tongue? You can see it. And that is the end.